be joining us right now. Hey, Brian. Hey, Lauren. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? I'm well. You did. You, changed your, you changed your lighting. A little bit, yeah. So you can see me now. I'm not dark and Did you go and out and buy one of those fancy, like, lights that goes around your phone? Like, you know. No. I <laughs> it's a different light. Just turning some lights on, I guess, is all that matters. Got it. Um, yeah, how is it in Seattle? Is it cooled off at all, or is it now hot? Yeah, it has. I mean, we're lucky because Portland is getting, I think they're going back up to close to 100 this week, and I know much of the country was, but ever since we had that heat dome, once it finally left, um, it's been, the marine air has kept the heat out of here. So it's going to get up to 90 this weekend, um, but it uh, has not been crazy since that one week. That one week was really hard, though. I mean, we don't have air conditioning because... Uh, most people in Seattle don't have air conditioning because you don't normally need it. Right. And at one point, we had a bunch of my chocolate in the house. We had to schlep it over to uh, some place with air conditioning. And we had to do it early in the morning before it got too hot. So it was uh, it was dicey. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, even my home. I actually just moved. And I now have air conditioning. But I've lived here for 15 years in a home without air conditioning. And people are like, why? Because oh, like, wow. I see 90 degrees twice a year. So Buffalo sounds like it has a similar climate to Seattle, except in the winter, perhaps. It's, it's been a little like Seattle this year, this summer. It's been a little wet and cool. Okay. So anyway. Better than 100 degrees. True. We could talk about the weather for the whole hour, or we could try talking about chocolate. I mean, I guess it's sort of what uh, – I don't care. I'll talk about whatever. But, you can say know. that's a tough call. I'm kidding. <laughs> Definitely chocolate. And I, I was starting to sort of describe who you were, but I'm going to let you do it, but – you're one of the one of the few non like chocolate either makers or users that's been on this program in the 17 months that we've been doing it so you know i you're gonna have to justify it with your immense chocolate knowledge which is great and large <laughs> got it got it okay so I'll, I'll start with how did i get into this business um I think like so many, I mean, so many of the chocolate makers and chocolatiers I know, you know, I had a previous life and business and, um, you know, I always wanted to, to build something where I could have community, you know, and get to know customers and, and build a community around something and, and food in particular and, you know, more particularly chocolate. And this was probably, I started researching and, you know, thinking about doing this around 2005. And um, I checked out, I, you know, I thought if I'm going to do this, I need to read some books. So I checked out some books from the library. Um, the first one I read was actually Mort Rosenblum's uh, Chocolate, a Bittersweet Saga of Dark and Light, I believe, is the subtitle. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he is a war journalist, actually. Worked for the Herald Tribune, which, of course, was owned by the New York Times and the Washington Post, and, and he was the Paris Bureau editor. And so he'd written a lot of books like that, but then he'd written a few on food. And, and the book was a fun, quick read. You know, it was written very engagingly. And it kind of dove into all sort of a very um, quick thought of all the different topics. So, you know, it, at one point he visits a cocoa farmer in the Ivory Coast. He, at the time, Godiva was still owned by Campbell's Soup. So he goes to New York and he tries to meet up with a marketing person at, at Godiva. And, and I, the, the title was, uh, or the chapter was, The Empress is All Closed. And he finally meets up with the Godiva person. And he says to them, so why is it that, you know, so many Americans consider Godiva premium chocolate? And the guy says, well, when surveyed, 80% of Americans consider Godiva premium chocolate. So it was sort of this circular argument, but he went there, he went to, you know, chocolatiers in Paris. He, he you know, he went and visited Steve DeVries. He, he walked around with Chloe, walked around Paris with Chloe. And so it was this wonderful kind of overview of, of the sort of pioneers in, in craft chocolate back in around 2005. And so I absolutely loved this book. And I thought, well, okay, then I can read Chloe's book. So I read The Chocolate Connoisseur. Um, which, you know, got me further down. And then I read all the books in her bibliography and I read Maricel's book. And, you know, I just, I kept going from there. And I think, I would say the theme for my own career has been, I, I do love to educate people. I mean, I'm a business person. I come from the world of business, but for me, it's about educating people. And I think the story of chocolate, which I think is what so many of us are, are attracted to as well, um, it, it's so rich, you know, it's got, it's got a lot of history. It's got you know, a lot of difficult socioeconomic and political issues. And then, of course, there's the whole sensory aspect, which I absolutely love, is the tasting. And, right. um, you know, and, and I think that the the moment for me was, you know, I used to I'd take a wine class here and there and every once in a while, and I'd get so frustrated because people would be tasting and they'd be like, oh, it tastes like road tart, it tastes like raspberries. And I'd be thinking, it tastes 
like, why? Like, <laughs> tastes like grapes. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't until I started tasting chocolate. So I'd sit down and I'd do these much more thoughtful tastings. And we were at a friend's house shortly thereafter, and they gave me a glass of white wine and drinking the wine. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this tastes like perfume. And I suddenly realized that because I had trained my senses on tasting chocolate, I was beginning to pick up the things in wine and other foods that I'd never been able to pick up. Um, so th that's kind of a very stream of consciousness of how I got started. No, but, um, but you know, I think it really is the story of chocolate. I mean, how did you, how did you get into this? I don't think well, I, I have know. A, I have a question first, though, because I think doing like this is this project. I don't know. Like, I don't know if we've really talked about it. This project happened strictly out of COVID. Like, I better find something to do or else people are going to like cut my hours. So sure, I'll go on the <laughs> Internet. Like I'll, I'll use social media. But I've gotten the pleasure to talk to like close to like 60 people, like 70 actually in the last year and a half, right? And people that are involved in chocolate and some are craft makers and some are, you know, remelters. We'll get to that term later. Um, but people that have, that have been in the chocolate business for a long time. And a lot of times you ask that question, like, how'd you get here, right? And, and sometimes there's this like elaborate story about like, well, my grandmother had me on her apron strings when I was five. And other people are like, I read a book and I decided I could do it. And it's just like, okay, cool. But I think so many people have like a food culture. And I guess that's my question. That was a very long way of asking that question. But did you, I mean, you told me before you grew up in Northern Virginia, you know, but did you grow up with a food culture in your house that food was always important? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's interesting. My father was from Brooklyn and his parents came over at the turn of the century. They, you know, my grandparents were immigrants and um, food was so incredibly important to him. Um, so, yes, I grew up with a food culture. I, you know, my mother came from the Midwest and wasn't as food focused as my father. So it was really what my father's culture was. So, um, you know, I, I didn't grow up with, I wasn't on someone's apron strings cooking because my grandparents had all passed away before I was born. There was a big age gap there. So I unfortunately didn't get to benefit from that. But I did get, a, get to benefit from the love my father had of, of all food. And, you know, he'd do the grocery shopping in the family. He'd go to certain stores for some things, other stores for other things, you know. Um, and for him, it, you know, when we would go to a city, it was fun to look at the grocery store, <laughs> see what they had. So I think it was always just, you know, kind of seeking out um, interesting and good foods and, and enjoying them. So, it, you know, it, it wasn't a particular, I mean, you know, he came from a Jewish background, so I grew up with some of that, but he wasn't the one cooking either. So right. he liked to cook, he just didn't have much of an attention span. So that didn't work very well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but I think that's the cool thing, right? Like, like my wife's family is, she's second generation from, from Central America. And there, there's still, there are still items that, Chris is the only one that's allowed to cook in our house, right? Like, you know, when we first got together, I did all the cooking and except for when a rose con pollo was being made. And then like, <laughs> don't, it's like, I'm not gonna pretend to make a rose con pollo the way, the way, you know, grandmother does. And I think that chocolate is one of those things, we were talking with Bill Saris last week, who is a second generation candy maker and is passing that on to his kids. And, you know, what's the one thing you learned from your dad? And it was like, how to make caramel. You know, that was like, right? And I think that's cool about food, right? I mean, chocolate, obviously, there's, there's an education standpoint from your standpoint, but there's got to be somewhere early on about, yeah. did you remember chocolate, whether that's at 20 when you were in college or at eight when you broke into, like in my story, it's I broke into the, the cupboard at like seven, right? And I, I scrambled up onto the counter and I pried open the cabinet and there's this block of chocolate. It's got to be like what I expect, right? And I put this thing in my mouth, and it's 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 for all intents and purposes liquor, right? I mean, it, it's it's a, probably a block of Baker's chocolate, and I spit this out, and I scramble <laughs> away, and everybody in my family laughs still, but that's what I remember, and that's where it started. I mean, th is there is there a chocolate place like that for you, other than reading this really great book that I probably should read that I haven't yet? Well, yeah, and it was actually part of reading those books because. Um, I admit, I grew up eating mass market chocolate, right? And my dad, you know, like he would go get like the Cadbury milk fruit and nut bars and whatever. And, you know, my mother would eat the Hershey's Special Dark, which at the time felt like dark chocolate to me. And I thought it was so bitter, which I laugh at now because it's so sweet. Um, <laughs> but, 
but um, but it was when I was um, doing all that, I thought, okay, I'm going to go get good bars of chocolate and start tasting. And it was a Bonat Madagascar bar, which I laugh. I always tell customers, you know, if you read the story of pretty much any craft chocolate maker, 99% of the time it started with a bar of chocolate made with cacao from Madagascar. <laughs> like that's the, that's the gateway right. chocolate, right? Because it's so amazing. I mean, I was just blown away by the fruitiness, um, the amazing cherry notes. And I think for me, you know, I don't like things that are really bitter. And so I'd always associated chocolate with bitter, which I now realize there were many things that went into that bitter that I would consider bitter. It was probably over roasted. There was probably dutching going on. There's probably lots of stuff I didn't like about it. And I think it was then I was like, oh, this is this is really good. I love this chocolate. And I always tell consumers, you know, I used to eat mostly milk chocolate. Now I eat pretty much mostly all dark chocolate. Once in a while, I'll have my piece of milk. Um, and I never thought I'd say that, you know, and I, I enjoy 100 percent, too. Um, so I think for me, it was, you know, the books got me in. And then it was really enjoying the, um, the tasting and sensory experience of it and my love of food and thinking, well, I tend to like things that are the best quality of something. Let me let me move into chocolate. Right. I will say that my my favorite moment was my father before he passed away. You know, the man who used to go buy the Cadbury fruit nut bars. <laughs> Uh, one time he had the choice of me giving him something very sweet and milky versus a really nice dark bar of chocolate. He took the nice dark, dark bar of chocolate and I thought, I succeeded. <laughs> right. So, yeah. hey, I actually did some research on this interview because we kind of know each other. We know each other professionally, but we don't know each other very well. So, like, I watched a YouTube video today of you and, like, I, like, wow. I went to your LinkedIn profile. So, like, I'm yeah. down with Lauren now. So, but do you have a background not – online marketing most recently before? it's not marketing no it's supply chain supply and, chain um, sorry marketing that's now. okay i mean both, i have finance merchandising and supply chain background um both supermarket chains and then e-commerce right. so i came with the business piece of it and i think it is a reminder of how hard it is to be a sole proprietor and have a small business because it doesn't matter what skill set you come in with and what your you know business plan is important but it's also just a plan it's not right. what's actually going to happen and um you know, I came in with all this background and did this whole business plan. But, you know, reality was very different. I mean, I opened Chocolopolis in 2008. Okay, so we do the research because I cut you off. So you do all this research and you decide right. you want to do something with chocolate and you want to do something educational. And you and this is sort of the burgeoning craft chocolate is happening, right? Yeah. This you know, I, I'm just putting it in perspective at this yeah. point. And so you decide that you're going to write a business plan for Chocolopolis. Yeah, because I think, you know, for me, where craft chocolate was at that point, it was just this incredible story. And I love to think about how do you organize information in a way that's meaningful to people. And so for me, it was like, okay, we're going to take these bars, we're going to merchandise them by cacao origin. So in the store, we actually had color coded, we had a key, we had color coded areas, we had a section devoted to Ecuador, to Venezuela, um, to Madagascar, and then, you know, broader regions like Central and South America, Africa, etc. And we would put the bars in those regions. And this was back in 2008 when we opened. And so for me, that that was an important way to help consumers start to think about chocolate as they might wine or coffee, right? So, um, but I think for me, it was, you know, putting this business plan together and thinking about how do you convey the story of craft chocolate in a retail environment to help move customers and help them understand that it's ex an experience, you know? And I think one of the challenges was it is a tough business and people kept saying, you've got to put coffee in, you've got to put coffee in. And I thought, one, I don't drink coffee. I don't know anything about it. And two, I don't want to be like every other coffee shop in Seattle. Um, you know, it might have gotten me some good margin, but I think it would have diluted the experience of the chocolate. And so I chose to go in this very chocolate retail store kind of direction where we had, you know, hundreds of bars. And this is back again in 2008. There wasn't a lot on the market at that point. So we had the five American craft chocolate makers, which were, Patrick, um, well, actually it would have been six, Patrick, Rogue, Theo, Taza, Askinosi, and then Steve DeVries had just stopped producing, so we couldn't have his. And then we had a bunch of Europeans like Amade, Valrona, Demore, Chocolat Vice, you know, others, because we filled in with uh, Chocolate El Rey. Right. We, um, Google Goodell Cacao at that point was producing retail bars out of Ecuador. So we had all of that, and we started to, you know, to, to uh, show customers the story. Um, and then obviously a lot has changed since then. <laughs> it has, but it has. I, I think there are more people in the, there's more people in the channel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But 
I think in a lot of ways, it, the, the industry hasn't, that part portion of the industry hasn't evolved all that much. Does that, yeah, is that I mean, fair? Like, I, I, don't, yeah, want to, I, mean, I don't mean to disrespectfully either. I mean, it, it's no, just, no. there's still a lot of small people that are, there, there's some small people that are doing some really great stuff, right? And there's some small people that, that are aspirationally doing better stuff. Yes. Is that a fair way I to mean, it? Yeah, I think, you know, that's one of the challenges. Our, our segment of the industry faces a number of challenges. I mean, first of all, I love the fine chocolate segment of the industry. They, um, you know, everybody's so passionate about getting better quality cacao, paying the farmers more, making lives, improving lives, and providing consumers with a really fantastic product and story. I think the challenges we face are, one, you know, there's more consumer demand now than there was in 2008, for sure. Like consumers at least know what craft chocolate is off and on. They, you know, they get the single origin, but there's a lot more supply than there is demand right now. And how do you move those consumers up to be willing to pay more? You know, do you meet them where they are, you know, and give them the, the types of confectionery bars they're used to and then try to move them up? Or are there other ways of doing it? And I think that is the biggest challenge we face. And I think as the, a former retailer, you know, now I do classes online, whatever. So I do still stock a few bars. My favorite makers are often not the people who end up succeeding in business because they're great at making chocolate, but they're such perfectionists and I love that about them and I love their chocolate. It's really hard to run a business that way. And so sometimes they don't succeed as a business and that's unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, we, so obviously we sell equipment, you know, so full <laughs> disclosure, you know, and we were doing some trials with some bean to bar equipment the other day, right? And we were playing with the conch Right, and, and doing trials exclusively based on the conch, not based on roasting, not based on milling. And the reality of it created like six distinctly different products with the conch, with the same roast, this, you know what I mean? And yeah. I think that nuance requires the perfectionist, but that costs money, right? Mm -hmm. Like for me to put 25 kilos of product or 50 pounds in, that I may not sell that. Like, there's no intention of me. I look. I'm not gonna. I'm definitely not gonna sell it. But <laughs> like the that that craft maker who is passionate about what they do and and really wants to make a great product is often undercapitalized and all those things we know about, right? That fifty that fifty pounds of chocolate is thirty pounds of beans at six to eight dollars a pound right and i've done that with roasting first right, right. I've, I've roasted four times like that to make sure so now we're at now we're at what's that 200 pounds of beans 250 pounds of beans so now we're talking about a two thousand dollar experiment yeah that that's nothing when you're when you're cadbury right right <laughs> No, yeah. exactly. I, mean, I think, you know, there's, I, and it's not to say, I don't mean to say that the small perfectionists are the best chocolate makers. I think there are plenty of large chocolate makers that I think produce nice product because it is a manufacturing process, right? So sometimes if you have, one, you have to scale to make it cost effective and actually succeed. And then the other piece is if you scale and it, it is a manufacturing process, if you have really good process control and quality control, you may be in a better position to produce a quality product because you can create that consistency. And I once said to, to Colin Gasco from Rogue Chocolate here, I said something about consistency and Colin was like, I'm not going for consistency. And I said, let me, let me reframe what I mean by consistency. I get that every batch is going to have a different flavor profile. That's fine. But what I mean is um, I want to see the same quality each time. And I think that's really where a lot of craft chocolate makers struggle is, you know, I'll get one batch that's got this amazing flavor profile and the same bar will come in. It's a new batch of cacao or they made a new batch of chocolate. And I don't know this necessarily. And I go to taste, and I've now ordered in a whole bunch of chocolate that I think my consumers are going to buy, and suddenly it's a bar I don't like and I can't recommend because I'm tasting mold in the cacao, or, you know, the texture isn't the same as it was last time, or, you know. So, yeah, the flavor profile can change, but you've got to get to a manufacturing process where you can give me that consistent quality every time, and I think that's also an area that the craft industry can struggle with sometimes. Yeah, I think, and especially when it's at a premium. Yeah. Right. I mean, look, 1988, I, I, I eat a Big Mac in Moscow, right? 
waited in line like 45 minutes so I could say at a Big Mac in Moscow in 1988, 89, something like that. That Big Mac was exactly the same as the Big Mac that I had, you know, at the airport at JFK before I got on the flight to Leningrad, right? right. I mean, it was. Um, that was the expectation, right? I mean, I think, I think culturally we're evolving a little bit that we know that we less, there are less people that need that all the time. They need this, this cookie cutter experience in regards to food, right? That we allow our, our food, non mass market food, but like our local, the, that restaurant, that dish is going to evolve and, and we're going to trust that the chef is cooking in such a way that we're still going to enjoy it. Right? Exactly. It's still going to be quality. We may not, we may not like right. it as much because they've, they've altered the recipe something, but consistency, this, the, the center plate item is still cooked exactly the same way. Right. Yeah, exactly. But, but I think you're right. And I think the, the challenges are, there's some supply chain challenges on that. Right. Like mm -hmm. I've got to trust a bunch of people to get that bag of beans into my building of the same quality that they were the last time. And, right. and some of those people are, are more interested in dollars than they are about quality. Right. You know, and then I have to manufacture it the same way. Right. Exactly. Which, which is a whole nother, uh, which is my, my concern about the industry is like, what controls do we have to make sure that that product is of the same quality, whether that is whatever it is, you know, are we, are we checking for moisture? Are we checking for microbiologicals? Are we checking for micron size? Are we checking for fat content? All that stuff. Right. Well, that's why they need good equipment from you. Well, no, because I, mean, I think those are, those are things that we don't sell, right? Like those are the ancillary things. Like, yeah. like, you know, when we move from that, three kg melanger that you know you bought on amazon to okay i'm going to make i'm all i'm all in and i'm going to make 100 pounds a week or i'm going to make a thousand pounds a week then you've got to have you you've given up control so you have to have quality checks right i think that's well what and i think about. yeah no and yeah and but then also i mean just think about that you're now starting with no equipment so you're kind of starting over right you've learned some things but you kind of have to re rejigger your process. So every time you scale up like that, you're redoing things. Just back to a point you were making earlier, I think back to my customers, you know, when they would go travel and they'd go get chocolate, um, you know, from chocolate makers around the world, and they'd bring it back, and they'd have me taste it. And every once in a while, one of them would say to me, well, this isn't very good. But, but in that moment, when they were meeting that chocolate maker and enjoying the chocolate with them, it was like the best bar of chocolate they'd ever had because it was about the experience. And then they'd say, well, I'd never buy this again. And I think... That's a challenge too. I can't tell you, and I'm sure you've had this too. How many people walk in and go, oh, I'm making chocolate from the bean. Everybody, all my friends and family and all my coworkers tell me how good it is. And I'm like, well, you're handing them free chocolate. You just made it for them. That experience is, is priceless, but is it really good? I don't know. Maybe, you know, would, would, if you put it on a shelf, would someone pay $10 for it? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so I think that's, that's also an important factor. There are so much supply right now of craft chocolate. Um, and if a consumer has a $10 bar of chocolate and they think, and it's their first bar of craft chocolate and it doesn't live up to the standard they're expecting, are they going to buy it again? And they may, then, then they, are they going to buy other craft chocolate? Are they willing to take that chain up? Yeah, it's, it's a hard, you know, it's, it's a hard, like I'm a chocolate guy, right? And so, right. you know, chocolate's an ingredient in many ways in, in my perspective, but it's, but it's more than that too, right? I mean, so it gets a little squirrely in my head about how I think about chocolate, but there, there's, as an ingredient, I do want the Big Mac, right? Because I want, I want to be able to do what I want with it. And I need to know that it's the same or at least right. similar, right? But as, but as a consumer, I'm with you. I, you, you're, it should float like that. Yeah. It shouldn't be a fixed point in time. And I want to enjoy different things at different points in time, right. Based on what's, you know, what's going on in my life. Right. right. What I feel like today, you know, today I feel like this, I, I feel like, I feel like a little astringency today, you know, <laughs> versus I need, I need all red fruit and, right. you know, and Oak. You know, I, mean, I, rarely, yeah, just, I rarely need mold. 
<laughs> yeah, I really need both too. Um, but you know, even just from what you're saying here too, I see my own palette. Um, you know, like I'm sure everybody's, it's adapting over time and 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 growing. Like when I first got into this, I just wanted the big bars that kind of punched you in the face with personality, like those Madagascar bars with the screaming cherry notes. And you know, as I've gone on, you know, now I'm looking for much more subtle things with a lot of complexity and. Um, you know, just very different things over time. And I think that's a journey everybody probably goes on as in, in any food, be it chocolate or wine or coffee or whatever, as they start to taste a lot of something, you know, your, your palate starts to change and, and look for different things too. Yeah, it's, it's, I always tell the story and, you know, I had, a, I had a friend in college who, Amy was a, was a white Zin drinker, like, <laughs> or pink, pink, what, Zin, pink Zinfandel, whatever, like, and like, like one step up from Boone's farm, generally, you know, and her and her husband now collect single vintage Cabernets, right? And that, and that evolution took 25 years, 20 years, something like that, right? Where if you'd ask me, is that person ever going to be that person? Is that, is that white Zin drinker ever going to be a single, you know, vintage Cabernet drinker? It would have been like, no way, man. There's no way she's going to get there. <laughs> but they did that because of what you've talked about that we, we can, I can, you can, anybody can learn to taste. Right. Like that whole thing where people go, well, I, I, I'm never going to be able to taste that to me is, is total BS. Yeah. You know, we can, we can learn to do that. And some people are better than others. Don't get me wrong. But like knowing, being able to taste the subtleties of a chocolate is, is not always that hard. If you, if you take the time to slow down, right. And really learn from somebody that knows how to do it. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, that goes back to my example of where I, you know, I finally, after many years of trying to taste wine, couldn't, and then with the chocolate, I could. I mean, I think if you're interested enough in any food and you sit down and you taste it in a very focused manner where, you know, you get rid of all the other things that are going on around you, it's a quiet time, you're not, you don't have other things on your palate, you have a palate cleanser, and you're closing your eyes as you're tasting and thinking about it, you're, you're kind of training your brain, right? So, so the more you do that, the more you, the better you get at tasting. And I think, you know, I've been judging the International Chocolate Awards now, and I always really, because it's virtual, like, so I haven't had to go to Europe, and I haven't had to go to New York. And so I actually, actually love that time, because every morning I'd get up, and I, you know, I'd judge first thing in the morning, and I, it was quiet, you know, I had no, nothing going on around me, I'd get my polenta made, I'd, you know, get my warm water. <laughs> And, and I found that when I was judging, my senses in general would just be so acute because I was thinking and tasting. And, um, and it just, I, I found that for, you know, it, it just really reminds you of, of how much that tasting makes a difference. You know, there's some comments going on about tasting in the chat. And one of them is talking about comparing, right? And I think one of the things I see missing from, our, from that industry right now is that degree of difference tasting. We do, we do a lot of, we now do a lot of tasting about what flavors are there and what the intensities are. And we're beginning to remove preference. Like I've been on some things recently where preference is still a big deal. It's like when I'm tasting preference has nothing to do with what I'm tasting. Right. Right. Cause you don't want to know my preferences. I'll tell you later, no. you know, I'll tell you offline, <laughs> but, but because preference, like I said before, some days I want a little astringency and some days I want a little red fruit. That's a preference thing. But, but the next step is really that degree of difference. And it does take a bunch of people saying, okay, this is what it was. This is what it is now. Are they the same or are they different? And if they're different, do we want them to be the same? Right? right. And, and, if well, you're, and if you're Calibo, the answer is you want them to be the same. Yeah. They have to be the same. <laughs> Right, they have to be. If, well, if you're you know, Rana, funny. do you want them to be yeah. the same? And I, I, you know, I can't speak to that. Yeah, and I, I was just going to say, you, taking your example, I have a, the perfect one, Bernichon, the French chocolate maker. Somebody brought me, I've had a few bars that people have brought me back from France, and it's funny because it's, it, for me, that is the bar that I'm tasting it, and I'm thinking this is a really well-made bar of chocolate. It tastes like I'm eating tobacco leaves in a leather jacket, which is not really my favorite flavor profile, but it's a really nice bar of chocolate. So, I mean, it, it, I think what you're saying is it's also being able to separate your own preferences from what's a good chocolate, right? And it, it is an amazing chocolate. I, you know, it's one that I, I still enjoy once in a while, but it might not always be my first choice, depending on what my preference is, as you said, that day, right? 
Right. Like, look, I think sea urchin tastes like muddy jello. And muddy jello is not something that I want to eat. That, <laughs> that doesn't mean that there aren't people that have a preference for muddy jello. Go figure. Um, I think you may have just ruined my ability to, try to eat sea urchin. <laughs> I hadn't really I, thought about it that way. <laughs> it's sort of gritty jello. Anyway, but yeah. in all seriousness, like there, there, are, there are, in that trial that we were doing a couple weeks ago, right? So we were, we were pulling out of the conch every four hours and trying to really determine things. My preference was this really spiky, like, you know, it punched you with red fruit and then it came back with this like sweet thing. And then at the end, there was this like astringency at like hour four. And that was my, that right. was my personal preference. But the chocolate at like hour 11 was probably a better chocolate, right? Like, but, but did you let it sit for three weeks, all those, and try them again? We're, 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 they're sitting right now waiting for that to happen. But, but that, but see, that's part of the point, right? Like, I think we have to know what happens in all those stages. Yeah. And we definitely. have to be able to know, okay, if I do this with the chocolate, this is what's going to happen. And back to my right. point earlier, the only way to do that is to do that, right? right? You can't, you yeah. can't theoretical, like compute that. You can't like, you know, based on what happened before, what's going to, you can start to make some, some assumptions about what's going to happen. Right. But you don't know until you know. Yeah. Right. No, it's a good and that, and that, but back to my point earlier, that just costs time and money. Yeah. And then what happened, somebody was talking, commenting earlier too about, do you, if it's not what you expect, you pitch it. So this is, as a retailer, this drove me crazy. Um, we had a blend section, right? So we had all these single origin sections and then we had a blend section. There were very few chocolatiers or chocolate makers who I thought did good blends. I thought Soma was particularly good at blending. Um, but I do feel like a lot of chocolate makers use it as their trash can when they get bad beans. And to me, if you get bad beans, don't sell them to me. They're not, it's not helping you. I mean, and this is the challenge. You've got a lot of small makers who have limited capital, right? And they've now got this batch of beans that maybe has a moldy note, so they go make the, you know, the bar of chocolate anyway where they throw it in a blend and that blend is no better than the worst beans that went into it. And now it's sitting on my shelf. I'm not going to order it again because I've just had a bad experience. My customers aren't going to buy it because I'm not going to recommend it to them. And I'm, I'm not going to want to order it ever again. And so it, that, that doesn't help you in the long run. Yeah. Like we had the story and it doesn't matter who it was. They, they sent a bag of beans in for us to do a trial and I popped the bag open and the bag's moldy, like, Ooh. like moldy. And, you know, I'm kind of like sh trying to sugarcoat this conversation because they've, you know, they've, they've shipped in a $500 bag of beans and, but I'm not putting it in the roaster, right? I'm just not putting it in the roaster and I'm definitely then not putting it in the, in the winnower. And then I'm definitely not putting it in the ball mill. Like those are three things that are not <laughs> happening, right? And well, why not? It's like, because we're going to create really substandard product and I'm going to, make substandard product after it because it's going to contaminate everything in my process. Right. And yeah, that's, that's hard. Like that's a hard pill to swallow. Like you said, talked about your own business. I mean, you have this business model and you write the plan and you like, you're ready to go in and it's just like, and then something like that happens and it's just like, well, what do I do? Right. It can totally take you out of business. And so I, I get that, it, you know, it's easy for me to stand here and say, don't give me a bar of chocolate made with that. But I get it. I mean, I know it's a hard decision and sometimes it's an impossible decision. Um, it is know, without recourse, right? So like, if, if, I, if, I go, if I go to Trader Joe's, right? Right. And, and I get, I don't know, I get really weird stuff at Trader Joe's, but I get something that I don't care for. I walk back to Trader Joe's and I put it on the counter and they go, great, we'll take that back. Yep end of conversation like and i think culturally that's what we're used to even if i order tomatoes from my from my tomato vendor from my vegetable vendor and they're not what i expect them i tell them that i'm not paying for them and they go all right and they take them back you know and i yeah and i mean i think just as we're talking about the manufacturing process and, and quality and and everything else you know i think we often compare ourselves to especially coffee industry but it's a really different industry right because in coffee you get a bag of beans, you roast them, 
you, know, you pour water through them and you serve them, right? So, and if you get a bad bag, you know, it's not great, but you probably aren't going to like break the bank by not using it, right? right? Because you've got very high margin product that you're pouring water through. And it, you know, with chocolate, you've now, you know, it's a manufacturing process. So you've got like probably five or four or five at least pieces of capital equipment after that roaster. Um, and then you're manufacturing, and, so you've, and then you've got all these steps in the way where the flavor can change, as you yourself are alluding to. You know, you're making it now, you're going to let it sit for three weeks, and we'll see how it tastes then, and it's going to be completely different. So you have all these different variables you're changing. And then when you get done, you've got a perishable product, or a, heat, a product that's perishable with heat, right? So I think it is, it is unfortunate, it is it's a challenge anyway, it, especially coffee. There's a lot on the sourcing side that I think we could probably learn from and maybe and, and improve upon. I'm not suggesting they have all the answers, but I think we can learn and improve on what they've done, um, and certainly on the sensory side. But when it comes to the actual end product, it, it is a very different product. Makes it much harder. Yeah, like I was, I was actually at a conference room in Switzerland, and this is I. I mean, I worked for Big Chocolate for a while, right? And so there's this conversation going on with the marketing team, and like they've moved to German because it's gotten really heated and then it comes back to, so I'm, I have no clue what's going on for like 15 minutes and it comes back to English and the, the, the head of this plant basically looks and goes, it is nearly impossible to make great chocolate with great beans. It is not possible to make good chocolate with bad beans. Right. And so what, what that told me was he was saying like, hey, we buy the best beans we possibly can. And for us to make a great product is still really, really friggin' hard. If, if you want us to shortcut the bean conversation, we can't do it. We just can't. It's, it, it definitely won't happen, right? Um, that's, a, that's, and I think that's part of the challenge about this industry. And so, again, somebody was commenting about it. It's like, why does the, the small chocolate here evolve? Because they're learning. Yeah. Right. But the hard part is convincing someone to pay for your product as you learn. Yeah. That's, I think you hit the nail on the head there. Right. Because you're right. Like if, if, if you know, you're making your, your 50 pounds a week and things are good and you want to go to 5,000 pounds a week or 500 or a hundred. Right. You've got to change equipment and your process changes again. Yep. <laughs> right. And now, now what? Now it's like, oh, how does that, like, we just get an installation out in your neck of the woods. And I get a phone call that's like, hey, now that we're using a 25 kg, in this case, ball mill, the product's different than it was when we were doing 3 kg in the stone melange. It's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it is. How do I get it back to where it was? It's like, well, there's a couple things you can try, but I, I, I can't give you that answer today. Like I can't, I just can't hand you 37 here. Right. Just do that. Right. <laughs> but, but from your standpoint as the retailer, right. For all this, which we will get back to your business at some point because we're running out of time and you know, you have, you've got like 10, 15 years of history to give in like five minutes as the retailer, I mean, that's got to be hard, right? Because how, your customers are trusting you to get good chocolate. Like, yeah, yeah, you, it is hard. You've got to do that stuff, right? Exactly. And like I said, stuff. you know, we've, I have an example of an award-winning bar. And the first bar we got that had the award, the year of the cacao was amazing. And it was an expensive bar. And so we had customers buying it. And then I ordered, not knowing it was a new batch. We got a new batch and it had a moldy note in it. And I now have this almost $20 bar of chocolate sitting on my shelf and I'm not recommending it anymore. And it's now sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And I'm like, I'm not ordering this again, um, which is unfortunate because <laughs> it was originally a very nice bar of chocolate. But I'm thinking if they're going to send me this, I can't trust that the next batch is going to be any better, even if it is a new batch with great beans. And I'm not willing to invest my money in this and, and you know, and, and try to, and my customers, I'm certainly not going to recommend it to them. And so it, it you know, when you, when we had the retail business, I had a lot of money tied up in inventory. And that was one of the things that makes this so hard. And I think, you know, as I reflect and look at some of the, especially food stores that get into chocolate, I think they're probably in a better position in general because they've got other products besides just the chocolate, right? So they've, 
got a broader customer base coming in for other things they can teach them about chocolate, it is really hard to do a chocolate focused retail store unless you're making everything yourself, which we were not. We we're making some confections, but that's also, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, you should have added so, coffee. What'd you say? Just add coffee. It'll be fine. Yeah, there you go. And you know, it's funny because I said that earlier how I didn't want to add coffee because I didn't know it, but everybody said, oh, you'll get great margin. You really should just do it. And I started having these thoughts like towards the end, like maybe I should do this. And I was talking to somebody recently who had closed their store and they had opened a second location that was coffee and chocolate. And they were like, coffee was the biggest mistake we made because then you get these pe coffee people coming in and they know exactly what they want. And you're not a coffee. I mean, like, like it's not your thing. And then they don't get the chocolate. And I mean, I'm sure you, it, it can, you, it can certainly work. And I'm sure plenty of people have figured out how to make it work, but I don't think it would have been the easy solution that everybody made it out to be, oh, add some coffee, you'll get margin. <laughs> it's, you know, that's, it sounds great, but I don't know. I, I, I'm not convinced it was the right solution for us. Yeah, I don't know. Knowing kind of what you did and what you put out there, it doesn't sound like that would have, I don't think, I don't think it would have been the right solution for you. How's that? Yeah. Is that a fair, is that a fair way? That, like, that's it, about to no, that is correct. And I, I do, I do, well, I mean, you know, like anything, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. so I sure learned a lot. And if I were going to do this again, I'd do a lot of things differently. But, um, uh, but, you know, I'm sure most business owners probably would say that whether they're successful or not, you learn a lot. Um, <laughs> probably more from the, the lack of successes and from the successes right i mean well, exactly that's where you learn the most all right so so you open with six american craft chocolatiers and a whole bunch of european stuff yeah 2008 2009 something like that right? it was um, july of 2008 july 2nd 2008 right before the market tanked <laughs> That was the other thing. Nobody knew what craft chocolate was, and then the housing market tanked. I mean, it was like, a, you know, everything you could imagine happened. So something you can't control. There was nothing you can do about that. So it is right. what it is. But, but you guys ended up doing okay. Yeah, I mean, is yeah, we did okay. Way? You did okay. We did okay. Wasn't enough for me. I mean, you know, I, I also, I also, you know, I come from business. I like thinking about business problems and things and how do you scale them and how do you grow things? And I think it got to the point where it's like, this isn't going to grow in its current iteration. And I'm, I kind of was like, okay, I'm, 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 my brain is not getting what it needs out of this anymore. Um, and I'm, I'm not as happy as I would like to be. The upside is I built this amazing community of chocolate lovers and, you know, I still have the online business. We still do virtual events. Um, and I have a tasting group that we're, we're, we still need to have our in-person meeting. We haven't had that in a while, but, um, but, you know, I've got this wonderful community of customers who love chocolate who still stay engaged online. And so that's been great because when I, as I said, when I got into this, for me, it was all about building community and getting to know my customers. And so I would say in that way, I've been incredibly successful. They're a wonderful group and they are so educated around cacao and chocolate and they, they're, they're so educated. It's amazing. And they just love it. And they love the stories and, and they're just so engaged and I feel very fortunate and many of them have become very good friends, which is such a nice benefit. Yeah. I think I, from the outside, the business aside, you know, I mean, I think Lauren, you, you are an industry leader, right? I mean, in, because then your, your voice is listened to and trusted in, in the industry because you are so knowledgeable about all the things we've been talking about, but also the flavor and, and on all those things. Right. Which is why, you know, why I wanted to hear, right. Because I think okay. when, you know, so Lauren and I sit on a committee together, part of the FCIA, and we'll talk about that in a second. And okay. If Lauren's going to start talking, it's time to listen. <laughs> right. Like, no, but and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean like that, I know, Brian. <laughs> but no, but I mean that in a really, I like, there are people in this in this industry that that I listen to, and then there are people that I trust, right? And I think when when you're talking about sort of the the nuances of the bean to bar industry, it's even though you're not sourcing cacao and you're not, I think there's a lot more people that could listen to you on the standpoint like you could help people sell more product. Like the conversation that we've had today. I think could help people sell more product because so. the reality of it is, look, yes, everybody wants to do more for the farmer and everybody should. Okay. Yeah. That, that's my belief that we're not, we're, we're still not taking care of the supply chain the right way. And, right. and that's part of everybody's story. Okay. 
that doesn't differentiate you, okay? Because you're obtaining bean from Ecuador doesn't differentiate you. But some of the stuff that we talked about, about quality product and customer focus and all those things, that's what's gonna differentiate you. And, that's, and, that, and the people that are having success, some of the people that I'm thinking about right now, and some of them are on here, so I don't wanna mention anybody's name, but <laughs> that is what they do. They wanna make the best possible product they can every day and are willing to, to make decisions to do that. Yeah. And market it according, and market, market it appropriately. Right. Right. No, you know, and I think that's your mantra. I mean, that's what I've heard you say in other places too. Like that's kind of your gig. That's like, that's your, your story. If that's fair. Right. Well, thank you. I, I think, um, you know, and I think going back to though, your point about, you know, like I said, and like you've said, our, our, the fine chocolate industry is so committed to trying to help the cacao farmers, but in reality, there's only so much we're going to be able to do as long as you re represent this tiny little fraction of the industry, right? right. So, you know, if we can scale and still produce a fabulous quality chocolate, yes, it'll be a higher price, but we can help more cacao farmers and, and, and improve more situations. And, and honestly, I look at us as like scrappy startup disruptors that hopefully help the rest of the industry maybe move in that direction. But we're only going to be able to do so much unless we can get to that level of scale. too. Right. But the good news is, is that chocolate cost-wise, right, scales well, right? The, the, yeah. the, the reality of it is, if I can make more chocolate, I can charge less for it. It's just, it, it's why, why can the, one of the, you know, the 500 pound gorillas in the room charge $3 a pound for chocolate? The reality of it is they're not paying that much less for beans. They're, they're, or they're raw materials. And they are in some cases, but they're not paying that much less, right? where if a craft chocolatier, a chocolate is $50 a pound, right? And Calibo is $5 a pound. Right. That's not in the raw materials. No, it's the economies of scale and the efficiency, which are huge, but you right. know. But even if you get to a place where you're different. making, even if you get to a place where you're making 100,000 pounds a year, you can benefit from some of those things versus making 1,000 pounds a year. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, that's my, that's, that's me looking at the market in that way. And then probably, we've probably like ripped the veil off of some of this conversation, but the good news is that like only chocolate, like total geeks listen to this conversation and they want to hear that stuff. So they're probably still here. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we can geek out on this all we want. Right. And, and like, I can totally like walk into this whole, whole thing. And I think that's for me, one of the things that I love about the FCIA is we can wonk out about that stuff, but I also think we need to be more inclusive to people that are less desiring to wonk out on this stuff, whether it's the bean to bar conversation or chocolate in general, right? Because there are people that don't really care about the story. Right, I mean, that's true. I mean, I, I guess I also look at it from a consumer standpoint. Um, there's a marketer I've, I've heard speak who's in Seattle who actually, um, she's a, she does specifically sustainability marketing and she always will pull up the statistics that, you know, yes, sustainability and, you know, the social message is very important, but you can't lead with that because that only appeals to 14% of the population. So that may be a key part of your message, but you've got to figure out what is important to the other, you know, what, let me do my math, 86% or, you know, the segments there. What is the biggest segment there? What's most important to them? Go to them and then follow with the, and by the way, here's our sustainability message, because that's how you're going to have an impact. And that's where I go back to, um, you know, we, we have challenges reaching, you know, more consumers. I think that's, that's part of it. Right. And also well, I mean, when I said meeting consumers where they are too, I, and the funny thing is I was so against this part, like, you know, for the whole time I have a business, I probably should have been more about meeting consumers where they were, it would have been more effective. Um, but you kind of have to recognize that reality. And if, you know, a huge number of consumers are buying milk chocolate with lots of like inclusions, then start there and then, then no. And by the way, listen to our story about our beans and then, you know, move them into other things. And that, and they're on here because I just saw them, but that, that company that we were working with a couple of weeks ago out in the Pacific Northwest, um, that the, 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 the owner of this business comes it from a, a sales and marketing side, right? And he's creating a product 
that meets people where they are and then is mm -hmm. filling in that craft story behind it and is less worried about the craft story and is worried about there are pieces about sustainability and 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 vegan and a couple other things but the craft part is good he's going to bring along with it and and i thought it was interesting it was just sort of like oh yeah that kind of makes sense like meet people where they are right meet <laughs> what where where can we be on trend and also get get do the things that we are passionate we're passionate about right right because right? yeah. not everybody's passionate about the same stuff no right no yeah so what are you doing now because so I've got this online community. Um, you can still go to chocolopolis.com. Um, we do, I, I didn't, I'm not doing events June, July, and August because it's too hot. Um, and we've had to, you know, ship all the chocolate. Um, but we were doing a lot of events um, during the winter months and I've already got some lined up for September, late September. So hopefully it'll cool down in the rest of the country, October, November, where we do, um, you know, we'll do like an hour and a half with a chocolate maker. Um, we're gonna be doing one, hopefully, couple in Africa where we've got the chocolate, we ship it to you in the US and then we get on with the chocolate maker or the person at the fermentary and we do like a virtual tour and we taste chocolate with them and, and we meet the players on the ground. Um, so for me, that's really fun. Cause again, as I said, I've got this great community of customers who are really geeky and really know a lot and they love these things and they get on and they ask great questions. And um, it's just really fun for me to do it with them and enjoy it with them. Um, so that, and then I do a lot of corporate tastings on the side that are separate from that in classes every so often. But I think, you know, my, my base of customers are far beyond the classes. They are the total geeks we're talking about. So for them, it's, and for me, it's kind of selfish, I guess. I really love these events because I get to sit in my chair here and go to Africa or wherever and, and talk to some of my favorite people in the chocolate industry, kind of like you're doing, Brian, and, uh, and hear from them and taste chocolate with them and, and then bring my customers along on the journey. Yeah. Um, I had planned to lead a trip to Ecuador uh, last May, <laughs> a chocolate trip with consumers. But, um, you know, and then we were thinking about next year. But I think um, I'm not sure at some point I probably will. But I want to kind of see at this point what's going on more with COVID since we really don't know. Yeah, I was supposed to be in Ecuador in April last year. Still sad. Sorry. It is sad. I'll get to go one of these days. I don't think Jeff Lou <laughs> is like, like taken the ticket yet i think it's still out there i think i have another like three months but i don't think i'm going to ecuador this year yeah oh well it's... all right so no disrespect by this question but i ask everybody this question everybody gets this question okay and i don't i don't i don't know the right frame of reference so you you're i don't know you're coming home you're okay i'll ask it this way you're going to a movie you remember what it's like to actually go to a movie theater right I actually went last month. We went to a movie. You're better than <laughs> I am. I've funny. not been to a movie yet. There were like five, there were probably 10 people in the whole theater, so it was fine. We were very spaced. <laughs> Got it. Okay, so you're, you go up and you're going to get your tub o, your vat o soda and your tub o popcorn. And you get to pick one mass market chocolate oh. or candy item. What do you buy? Uh, probably Junior Mints. <laughs> Okay. Not much chocolate in them, which is probably part of the reason, but <laughs> Okay, okay. So you've got to buy a mass market chocolate item. What do you get? If you if you have to buy a mass market chocolate item. When was the last oh, when, was the last time, when was the last time you had a mass market chocolate item? Wait, but that, that's not junior mints. I'm not, not okay junior mints. I decided I'm gonna okay. throw those out. I've let other people get away with that answer, but not you. Okay. When was uh, the last Reese's time you bought a mass market cup. chocolate item? It would be a Reese's peanut butter cup. <laughs> okay. That's cool. So here, can I give you my rationale? You, yeah, um, you, you've got, you got like four minutes. You can give the rationale right. the peanut butter cup and whatever you want to plug. So you got four okay. minutes to do both. Okay, thank you. Quickly on the, the peanut butter cup. At Halloween, if somebody presents me with one, I will still eat it. I used to love Kit Kats, but now they taste, I can't have them anymore. It's too much chocolate chocolate on them. <laughs> um, but the reason is peanut butter cup I can handle. So I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, I just, I hope people will come join our community um, and, and, and carry us along, you know, come along on the journey. I'm, I'm guessing that we have a lot of chocolate makers here, so that may not be quite as much, but their thing, but um, for consumers, certainly, you know, joining our community and doing events um, at chocolopolis.com, and we also are on Facebook, and I'm also at Chief Chocophile. So we have at Chocolopolis, at Chief Chocophile. Um, I post slightly different things on my two social media accounts. Um, you can check out our Facebook pages, but come to the website, sign up for the mailing list. I don't mail very often, but when I do, it's usually an interesting event. 
Um, I do put the events on Eventbrite as well, so you can find them there. And as cool. I said, I'm, I'm trying to nail down times and dates with some of these people for October and late September, and I hope to have those up soon, so we should have events on the calendar very soon. You've done that before. You were like, you were like, ready to go. <laughs> hey, Lauren, this, is, this has been <laughs> awesome. Oh, likewise, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. I was so flattered. Thanks for asking me to join you. Yeah, I think the next time I talk to you is at a at, on Zoom at a an FCIA like education committee meeting, which I probably yeah. Brian is probably for. a chair of the education committee. He's doing a fantastic job. Um, for any of you who have not attended FCIA webinars, I highly recommend them. Um, there's lots and of they're, really interesting they're inexpensive. Topics. They're they're value. They're they're, they're yes. value. They're a good value. Right. And Brian is the chair, and he's been doing a fantastic job. So thank you, Brian. I know. The only problem with doing a good job is that, like, I may get roped into having to do something else for the FCIA. But, you know, <laughs> anyway. All right. That's hey, the problem. Don't just jump up. <laughs> have a great weekend. Thank you. And you, too. Thank you. And thanks, everybody. Nice to see everybody. And um, thanks again.